Welcome to Drippings from the Honeycomb, the official podcast of Another 12 Ministries. We are so glad that you have decided to join us as we enjoy the sweetness of God's Word one verse at a time. Did Jesus voluntarily choose to die on the cross? Matthew 26, 53 and 54 contain a single statement by Jesus. And they say, Do you think I cannot call on my Father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? This statement by Jesus took place in response to one of his disciples stepping up to his defense during his arrest and taking action by cutting off the ear of one of the men who was arresting Jesus. The scene is set in the garden. Jesus has eaten the Passover dinner. He is with his disciples. He has been praying fervently before his father. His disciples have been asleep, but Jesus has been pouring out his heart, asking God if there is any other way for the redemption process to be fulfilled, for this cup of judgment to pass from me, then let that happen. Let me not have to drink down the cup of your wrath, but not my will, but your will be done. And so Jesus in this prayer is not so much wrestling with his obedience to the Father. He is setting an example for all of those who would follow after him so that they might understand what true submission to the will of God looked like. But Jesus was also handling the weakness of his human flesh in the appropriate way. Jesus is fully God and fully man, and as such he carries the weakness of the flesh. And so he was doing what every human should do who bears the weakness of the flesh when confronted with the extreme difficulty of a task of obedience. He was going to the Father for strength. He was going to the Father for comfort. Now, Jesus at no time was in danger of sinning by rejecting the will of his Father in heaven. Jesus was in perfect harmony with the Father. Jesus always is in perfect harmony with the Father. He has been for eternity, he is now, and he will be for eternity in perfect unity with the will of the Father. But during this period, right before his crucifixion, when the strain of this death was pressing down on his humanity, Jesus cried out to the Father for the strength to carry through with the mission that he had come to earth to accomplish. And on the heels of those prayers, on the heels of crying out to God, and we have those prayers recorded for us in different levels of details by the gospel writers, the men who are set to arrest Jesus come to take him. And during his arrest, one of his followers, whom the gospels identify as Peter, strikes an offensive blow against one of the arresting soldiers. And Jesus' response to Peter is absolutely stunning. He talks about this ability to cry out to his father, the same father that he has just been crying out to in anguish and in duress. And he informs everyone there that at his request, the father would grant him 12 legions of angels to defend him if he so desired. Now, before we even go on and look at the rest of his statement, we have to first establish what is 12 legions of angels. What does that even look like? A legion of Roman soldiers was comprised of about 6,000 fighting men. In other words, 6,000 soldiers plus their support group. That means that Jesus had at his beck and call 12 groups of 6,000 warrior angels that God would dispatch to him at his call. Now, if we think about that for a minute and we look through the scriptures, we see that angels are extremely powerful beings. When we read the account of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, for example, we see that there are at least two angels, depending on how one interprets the passage, the third figure possibly being a theophany. And we see that those two angels are the vehicle for the destruction of these cities. When Israel is freed from Egypt, we see that a single angel is dispatched to destroy all the firstborn of Egypt in a single night. When God judges David for numbering the people, we see that an angel appears in the heavens with a naked sword in his hand to strike Jerusalem, and yet in God's mercy he stays the angel's execution. And we see that when Jesus was risen from the dead, two angels came down and there was an earthquake and the soldiers there set to guard the tomb fainted like dead men. 
We also see images of angels in the heavenly places. Angels crying out with voices so loud that they shook the doorposts of the temple. And to put that in context, the temple is a solid stone structure. And so what we understand is that a single angel, as described in the scriptures, carries immense power. These are not simply human-level beings. These beings are created in such a way by God that they have immense power in our physical realm in this world. In fact, Kings 19 records a story about a single angel from the Lord coming down and slaying 185,000 soldiers in the Syrian army. And so we see that the power of a single angel is immense. It is far more than any mortal man can restrain. So when Jesus makes the statement that he is able at his beck and call to cry out to the Father and receive the aid of more than 72,000 angels, we must take this in context. The power that Jesus had at his command to avoid being arrested, to avoid being nailed to the cross, is more than can be imagined by mortal mankind. Jesus had an out. Jesus had an escape from the cross. He could have asked the Father, and the Father would have granted him these 72,000 angels. Remember that Jesus is sinless. He is perfect. And so in everything that he says, there is no lie. And so when he says, do you not think that I could call out to my father and he would at once grant me 72,000 angels or 12 legions of angels? Jesus is not using hyperbole. Jesus is not exaggerating. Jesus is explaining the situation as it actually was. He was telling his followers and all those who came to arrest him, you can only take me because I am willing to go with you. If I were unwilling, there is nothing that you could do to force me to that cross. There is nothing you could do to restrain me. There is no power on earth great enough that could be unleashed on me to force me to capitulate to your will. Now, normally in this podcast, we only look at one verse at a time. But because this statement is one statement that covers two verses together and is inseparable, we are looking at the two verses together because the first half of Jesus' statement is amazing. The fact that Jesus simply had this power at his beck and call is something that is worthy of looking into, worthy of understanding. This is the command of Jesus Christ. This is how much power was available to him. And remember that Jesus himself is divine. He has control over the weather. He has control over the spirit realm. He has the power to create, to destroy. So above Jesus' power that rests within him because of his divinity, he had at his disposal more than 72,000 angelic warriors that he could call upon for his aid. Not that he needed any aid. But to make the point that his power is that vast. He explains that this enormous angelic military is at his beck and call. But this amazing power, this amazing ability to call upon his father for world-dominating support is merely a framework through which Jesus is going to demonstrate his deep love for his people. Because he follows up this incredible statement with a simple question. In verse 54, he says, But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? You see, Jesus did not talk about this ability to call down angelic warriors on his behalf because he wanted to show off or because he wanted to let everybody know that they should be afraid of him, or because he was threatening them with some sort of future domination. Jesus was saying in a roundabout way, I love you so much that even though this ability exists to call down angelic rescue, as if I even needed that, but I have it, just so you understand, I have that available to me. I choose not to. I choose instead arrest, humiliation, beating, and death because the scriptures must be fulfilled so that your salvation will be complete. 
Jesus was saying to his followers, to everyone who reads the scripture today, to everyone who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I did this willingly. I did this voluntarily. I did not have to do this. I did not have to endure this abuse. I did not have to endure this death. But in the scriptures, I promised that I would. And so despite having the ability to overthrow those who were coming to take my life, I voluntarily gave up my life and suffered so that you would live. I think oftentimes today, we are quick to gloss over this part of the story of Jesus in the garden during his arrest. We talk about it in a very matter-of-fact way. And yet, it is incumbent on us to recognize the immense self-control, the immense determination that Jesus had, that he willingly shunned rescue. He willingly set his own power aside and the power that he had to call for help that would have spared him this horrific death of crucifixion. He chose crucifixion. He chose to fulfill the promises of God in the Old Testament. He chose to fulfill the scriptures because he loved his children, because he loved his people, because he came to make a way of salvation for everyone who would put their faith and trust in him. That was his goal. I don't think there's very many people who, given the ability to avoid one of the most, if not the most, gruesome deaths ever invented by mankind, would opt to go through with it, knowing that they had an out at any moment, even for the sake of love. That is a love that exceeds human capability. That is a love that could only generate from the divine. And because Jesus is divine, he did that for us. He willingly went to the cross and suffered, even though he had within his grasp the power to avoid suffering, the power to avoid the cross. You see, the plan of God, based in the love of his fallen people, was more important to Jesus than his own personal comfort, than his own position, than anything else. And that is what drove him to submit himself to the will of his Father and to suffer for our redemption. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Drippings from the Honeycomb. If you would like to learn more about Another 12 Ministries, and the work that we are doing to train youth ministry leaders to bring the gospel to young people, visit another12.org. If you would like to support our ministry, click on the donate link in the description below.